Um, <clears throat> thank you for joining in from wherever you are and hope you are all safe as we are really uh, facing <clears throat> A uh, very difficult time with COVID for last year and a half. And since this is an open webinar for around the world, so I'm not sure exactly which part of the world everyone is, uh, but hope you are safe and following whatever protocol you need to follow in your country. <clears throat> so having said that, I'm uh, going to start uh, today's webinar. I'm just going to set some ground rules uh, and then introduce the moderator and uh, she will take over from here. This is, uh, we have a very distinguished panel from three continents, from uh, Asia, from uh, South America, and from North America. So I think this is the first time we having any, any panelists from South America. So welcome Argentina, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, so I, we're gonna start a webinar and there will be the, the panelists will go. But if you have any questions, please send the questions in chat. We'll try to take as many questions as you want. And I'm from International Development Institute. We do capacity building program uh, uh, in a number of countries, train, mostly teachers training and administrators training in education and some projects. And, and uh, most of them are, are our uh, colleagues and we have worked with them. They represent different organizations. So once again, please uh, send your questions through chat window. It will be live on Facebook as well. And there will be a recording video available later. And I know we do lots of, we make get lots of questions from people that, hey, am I going to get any certificate from, uh, by attending this webinar? So I just want to let you know that uh, you're going to get uh, a re uh, some email uh, maybe tomorrow. And as long as you do the uh, review of the webinar, you send your feedback, you will automatically get a certificate. So I know I do get lots of emails. I'm saving myself from my inbox, um, answering those questions. And uh, with that, let me, it's my honor to introduce today's uh, moderator for my colleague and a really good friend, uh, Dr. Anna Flores. And Anna is a very senior officer at uh, US National Academy of Science, you know, Science, Engineering and Medicine NASM, in Washington, DC. And I have a huge long uh, bio of her, but I'm not really going to read from bio. I'm going to say uh, what I know about Anna. So she is very passionate about education. She's really passionate about technology, mathematics, and girls' education. And that's the reason how we met uh, a few years back. And uh, Anna has earned a PhD in industrial engineering from University of Central Florida. And, and she's, a, she's an engineer. Uh, as you know from her degree, she's an engineer by background, but her passion about in technology and how technology can be really utilized to make education more accessible, education more equitable. Uh, she's very passionate about it. She has authored a number of books and articles around this. And um, so with that, Anna, all yours. Thank you, Saman, for the kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are connecting from. I'm delighted to moderate this webinar that will tackle a very important issue that has a significant impact in the career opportunities and advancement of women, but also the economy of all nations. Today, we'll focus on the impact of COVID-19 on education, especially on the gender digital divide among girls and marginalized populations. COVID-19 pandemic has increased the gap and disparity in minorities and low-income communities. We'll first let the speakers present their work and then we'll move into the Q&A. I would like to ask you to please pose your questions in the chat room when we'll move into that section. We have an impressive group of experts today with us. It is an honor to introduce our first speaker today. Professor Farida Lambi is the co-founder of Pratan in India. She heads the Pratan Council for Vulnerable Children. Professor Lambi has more than 25 years of experience as an education and social activist. She currently serves on the Government of India Committee on Child Labor, Labor and Research in Education, where she has initiated national level policy changes. Professor Lambi has been working for the rights of sex workers 
and on various youth social issues, as well as multiple disaster relief efforts. In 2015, she received the Indira Gandhi Memorial Award for her contributions to education and child rights. Farida, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Professor Suman, for having me here. Um, I think it's very exciting for two reasons. One is that I'd heard about Dr. Suman, uh, but never met him. And this has uh, helped us to connect. And when I was talking to Anna, uh, it was my first conversation with Anna, actually. And uh, I felt like I know her for years because uh, the way she came across and you know asking questions, and uh, what struck me was that all around the globe, we, uh, we, we stay uh, far apart, but I think we, are, we have a lot of common um, issues. Having said that, uh, I told Anna, don't introduce me too much. I'll talk about myself. And uh, so my, my, I, have, I am a co-founder of Pratham, which is an organization committed to education. And we've been working with millions of children in India. And of late, we've also been now working internationally in the um, African uh, countries, especially in terms of assessment of learning outcomes. Uh, I don't want to talk much about Pratham because uh, I'm sure many of you know about Pratham. But as Pratham, just one line in Pratham is that we've been committed to working with marginalized children. We've been committed to making sure that children not only go to school and they have a right to schooling, but they need to have a right to education. Because right to schooling does not guarantee right to learn. And that's what we found here in India. Uh, and we are also committed to the most vulnerable children, whether it is the child laborers or it is the child children of the sex workers or children on the street. Because I always feel that while India has had universalization of education, we do have a segment of population which will always require some amount of handholding. And also uh, in terms of schemes and policy, which, will, which are related to getting everybody quality education. So as Pratham, we've been working in almost all the states of India and our mandate has been to work with the government systems uh, do not substitute the government systems, but supplement the government efforts. Because I feel governments are most powerful. They have the most resources. So people like us who are nonprofits or who are civil society people, uh, you know, persons, individuals, activists, need to give ideas and need to supplement government efforts so that the government is on the driver's seat. And we are there to make sure that policies reach the end. But today's... Um, Theme is uh, girls and uh, you know a divide actually a digital divide. Uh, I, I thought I would I would say a few uh, words about um, Indian situation and especially as far as COVID is concerned. Uh, as I think all of you here know that COVID has hit us the second wave. We are at the peak of the second wave right now. And I'm not really going into any the, anything of the, with the politics of the situation or you know vaccinations or whatever. But I think we are going through in India and everywhere else, we're going through a lot of pain, a lot of anguish and a lot of grief. Uh, in the first wave, uh, we were not sure how to handle. We didn't know what this whole COVID was about. And I, I, I thought that it was much more, a little further away from us. Um, second wave has hit everybody. Everybody means every single person. And it is a kind of a, I would say COVID has become a, a, a class equalizer because we often say in, in developing countries that diseases like diarrhea, diseases like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, typhoid or malaria or polio are with the poor. Whereas diabetes, high blood pressure is with the rich. And this is this has always been said about India. But COVID has proved one point that it's an equalizer. It, 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 it doesn't look at class. It doesn't look at blood. It doesn't look at religion. It has touched every single person. And I think that's where that's been our greatest learning as far as India is concerned. The other, other thing which has happened in India, and I think everywhere else, 
that we have suddenly realized that the so-called middle class, the upper middle class and the elite have realized that the city or the country works not because of us, 5%, but it works because of the 50 or 70 per 60 people, percent of people who are the most marginalized and who make your city and country work, whether it is the you know, labor, whether it is the uh, person who puts up the electricity, a person who's a driver, a person who, who's a, who runs your laundry, or your domestic worker. I think these are the people who are the mainstay of the society. And COVID has taught us that no city will work without them. So that's my second um, you know, aspect. Another important thing which has happened, and since we are working in education, it is very unfortunate that but for one and a half hour a year, schools haven't opened. And when schools don't open, and there is this kind of a little fear psychosis on one side that, you know, you know, whether we go to COVID, what will happen. But on the other side, I feel children, uh, though they've lost this whole aspect of socialization, being in school, meeting friends, I see a lot of resilience in children and in families right from day one, as far as the lockdown is concerned. Because we as Pratham, have been able to connect with these children through WhatsApp message, which I'll talk a little later. I'm sure Anna has questions about it, but I, you know, but we, they, there's a resilience and there is also this eagerness that when will our school start? So children want to go to school. The other unfortunate thing which has happened is the learning loss, which everybody is talking about. That there is a learning loss in children, children and anyway in India, those of you who know Pratham, those of you know that Pratham uh, releases a report which is called ASAM, Annual Status of Education Report, every year uh, to bring the learning, uh, you know, what is the learning, uh, le learning uh, parameters of children who are from first to eighth. And we found over the years, last 10 years, year after year, we found that children who are in grade five are, don't know, uh, you know, don't know much about grade five, but know as much as they should know in grade two. So what I'm saying is that children are two years behind their own levels or what you call is the grade. And if that was the issue in the normal times, you can imagine what has happened now with COVID. And, 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 and the other last part, part, part that I want to talk about and uh, Anna, you can stop me in the middle because uh, I'm sure you would ask questions. So uh, the other aspect which has happened as far as girls are concerned and the impact of COVID on, uh, uh, on the society, on the country in, in, with, with, with children, and since I'm in education, I can talk about it, uh, is that uh, there, they, there is a dropout that the girls and boys are not going to school. And I have a hunch. We don't have statistical data right now to present, but we have a hunch that once schools open and there are girls who are who have completed their say grade five and they're in the age bracket of say 12 and 14 or, or uh, 13 and 16, I have a hunch that they may not go to school. And if they go to school and if they are in private school, because in, in India we have private and public schools and our public schools are the government schools, uh, which are the free schools. Uh, I have a hunch that many parents will remove their children from the private school and say, and let the girls go to uh, government schools. I have a hunch. We have to still study this. But there is this, 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 this fear that all of us have. Another uh, data which has come to us that the girls who are, say, about 14 to 15 year old and where the parents are marginalized, where some of the parents are farmers, agriculture, and you've heard the crisis that we are having in our country uh, with farming, with agriculture sector, many girls who are say, below age of 16 are married. Okay, the marriages have taken place during COVID times. And there are two reasons for this. One is the security. Parents feel that once I get these girls married, my uh, you know, responsibility for life is over. 
Okay, she'll go to her husband's house and then look after him. That's one. Secondly, it's extremely economical in COVID times to get people married or to get girls married because you spend less, you call less people, and you can have three, four girls married together. Now, this has actually happened in, in India in many, many parts. So I think these are what I would say are the social um, aspects or I would say the social impact. The other important aspect which has happened is, and which is a positive, I would say, I was talking to Anna the other day, that what COVID has taught us or has, learned or has made us understand that there is something called the digital world. And you wouldn't believe it that every person in our organization, suppose we have 6,000 people in our organization and they work in different villages and education level is not great. They were all very scared about what is Zoom call, what is this Google Meet, uh, you know, what are all these gadgets that we are talking about. And COVID has actually helped all of us to communicate through all these Zoom calls. And all of us who are working from home today are able to connect with each other. I must say that it is not the best thing that can happen, but we have been forced to adopt technology, which many people would have not adopted technology at all. And because of the technology, you and me today can talk on this platform. Uh, we've been having so several webinars where you know, you're meeting people around the globe it would have never been possible. And so I feel that sometimes there are certain positive impacts of COVID and coming to girls. And I, I want to say this, that, and I was telling this to Anna, and maybe we'll elaborate it when you have more questions, that we work in the rural areas of India. We work right from the southern states to the northern states. We work in certain backward states where illiteracy is, uh, is high. But in many of these villages, I've seen women, okay, whether it is Uttar Pradesh or whether it is Bihar or whether it is Rajasthan, where women culturally are not supposed to get out of their house. Culturally, they are not supposed to mix around too much. These same women, if we give them a tab and we've told them that, you know, you are responsible for say five people around your house. You know, in Hindi, we say mohalla, or we say a cluster. Uh, and that woman is able to use her tab, tab, a tablet, and share her tab and the content that we are sending with her neighborhood. Now, when we do these things, the women get empowered. So I feel that there is some, some amount of positivity in what we, are, what we are doing, but there are certain challenges which have happened we are all talking about digital, 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 but it is not easy because when you're talking about digital in India, even in a place like Mumbai, where I'm sitting right now, only 60% of the children in the workers' colony or in the slums have what is called a smartphone, okay? And so when we say digital, and when we say we have to send online material, uh, many of the children do not get this online material because they do not have a resource. If they have a resource, there's a problem of the internet. There's a problem of recharge. There are n number of problems. And India, in terms of its, in terms of its geography and demography, all of you know, it's huge. Diversity is huge. So you, we, we are not able to actually access every child through digital uh, formats because these are real uh, issues. So we may say that we, children are connected online, but I, to tell you the truth, not everybody is connected through online and there will be children who have no access uh, to smartphones. And another thing which I want to say is that we have found in the last one and a half year when we are sending WhatsApp messages, we are sending content, we are sending quizzes, we are sending jokes, we are sending some academic material. Parents, mothers are enjoying it. Parents are liking it. But when it comes to other medias like TV or radio, what we have found is that in Mumbai, 
or even in many of the places, in many urban places, space is a major constraint. You have in one small room of 10 by 10, about eight people living, a couple having four children. Those four children are in different grades, different, uh, you know, somebody might be in grade four, somebody might be in three. And when you have a TV program or you have a television program, uh, you can imagine what must be happening because there are lessons grade wise, but children there are mixed. So at one point, one child is seeing grade four. After two hours of the grade five uh, lesson is being shown. So there is a confusion and the concentration is not much. And I'm really talking about the most vulnerable section. I'm talking about children who belong to the migrant laborers. I'm talking about street children. I'm talking about children with low income families. And in the rural areas, though the space is big, internet becomes a uh, problem. Another one which, which, which we, we found, which, which happens is, and it's a real, real one, that the father goes to work. And in my family, your family, you have each one of us has one mobile phone, okay, because we are privileged. But in these families, there is one mobile phone and the father, being a patriarchal society, man of the house, he carries his mobile to work. So when he comes back home at 7.30 or 8 or whatever time, he has the time to download the content which is sent by the teachers. So you can imagine the gap between what is being sent by the school, when it's received by the parent, and when does the child get. So these are actually real issues that we are all grappling with. I don't have ready-made answers right now. But what, you, what we are really doing right now is that we are trying out a hybrid model where we are saying we will do both. We will do online and we will also do offline. But maybe I can come back to all this a little later. Anna? Uh, Thank you, Professor Lambi, for giving I us a great that, overview yeah, yeah. of the current technology and educational challenges that children and also adults are confronting in India. In India. Yeah. I would like to introduce our second speaker now, uh, Dr. Revi Sterling has focused on closing digital divides for over 20 years. Currently, she designs and manages the gender and technology programs at USCID's Innovation Technology and Research Hub. Before coming to Washington, D.C. to work with the federal government, Revy funded and directed the first master's program in the United States on information and communications technology for development at the University of Colorado in Boulder. She also spent a decade at Microsoft's research spearheading efforts in gender equity in computer science for development. Revy holds a PhD in media technology and society and is the recipient of the Anita Bohr Institute Women of Vision Award for Social Impact and also the ASME Impact Engineer Award for Women in Technology. Revy, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Wow, well, thank you so much. And it's such an honor to be here because, I mean, Pratham is such an amazing organization and Girl Rising is beyond inspirational. I was just telling Judith and Brenda, uh, I've been guest teaching a course and the Girl Rising website is literally the curriculum to help you know, these American students that don't have a perspective um, on the rest of the world really understand what is happening, what is happening in the time of COVID, et cetera. Thank you for being here today. It's great to see this many attendees and it's so fun to see old friends that are from halfway around the world, like my, my pal Axel in Peru. So it is, it's a wonder, it's always great to reconnect in these spaces. As Anna said, my name is Revy and I've been focused on this thing called the gender digital divide. Of course, the kind of the, the gendered component of that digital have and have not um, phenomenon for, for quite some time. Um, hopefully she'll stay quiet, but I am joined by my co-pilot, Lola the cat, um, who has heard uh, this talk for at least the last 12 years, has heard me topic on it. So if I lose my voice, I'm turning it over to her. Um, I'm going to share a few slides, and uh, I don't mean to, to give you death by PowerPoint, but I do want to have... Um, I just, I just I want to provide a little bit of context for this conversation that Dr. Frieda was talking about, which is we're pushing digital, 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 and, and what that actually really means in the context of working with the people who need information the most 
and continue to be on the far side of the uh, digital divide. So um, I'm going to let I'm going to look over and see if Anna will give me the heads up that my slides are showing. Oh, yay. Okay, wonderful. Um, very briefly, I'm also putting my email up here because I, I, I would truly love to connect with any and all of you about these. If these slides are helpful to you, um, email me offline and I will send them to you. I'm not going to be able to keep track of people in chat, but just send me a piece of mail um, and let's connect because this is this is really like everybody on this call. We have to work together. We have to form a, you know, we have to keep this passion in all of us going, especially at times where the news can be just so devastatingly sad. Um, as we know from United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 5, gender equality, you know, the SDGs even call out the empowerment of women through technology as one of their targets and a mechanism for empowering women. And to me, that's wonderful to have that sort of normative high level goal. But the fact is that even while we know women are the key to sustainable you know, change in their community, we know they're responsible for the health and the education of their families and their communities. Um, we also know that this technology that should be able to help scale and sustain all development initiatives and, and, and um, sectors really fails to take women's standpoint into account, you know, and, and this is, I mean, as someone who is both a feminist and a pro tech and a technologist, this should be a force multiplier. Instead, we have technology, new technologies coming into communities that are exacerbating social divides and education divides as opposed to helping them. Um, and that's exactly what we shouldn't be doing, right? That's not equitable development. So um, even though technology is pushed as the answer to things like crises, COVID-19, now you need to homeschool from home. Now you need to meet the doctor online as opposed to going to the, to the office. Um, you know, the fact is that so many women I work with have to walk two hours to even charge their phones and their phones they're never going to have a smartphone in their life. Half the world is unconnected, and most of that component is women and girls. So there is such a reality check here. Um, you know, and we've known these, these barriers for, I mean, since the first paper that I found on this was in 1995, basically saying, if technology comes, you know, to poor communities, et cetera, you're going to have to watch out for this inevitable gender digital divide. Well, now it's here. That was 1995. And starting in 1997, when I started getting involved in this, this area of gender and technology and empowerment, all of these factors are the same ones that every person every year that comes to this space is like, oh, we have these problems. It's cost, it's literacy, it's perceived relevance. My take is we've been trying to handle this with Band-Aids. Here, let's subsidize your airtime. Let's give you some free phones. Let's give you a digital development solution that you're not gonna use a year from now. Um, when we really need to look at the social norms that underlie all of these divides that then manifest themselves. And of course the digital divide, we know there's no society where men and women are equal. And certainly COVID has exacerbated that. I, I'm from a rural area of Montana that has no internet. Well, how are those kids supposed to get to school uh, or learn? Um, and that's here in the States. And if you look at this uh, statement from um, Alliance for Affordable Internet, You'll see that up in a lot of the communities I work with, it's not just 80% of women that are offline in those communities, but there are whole legislations that keep women offline. There's the cop panchayats in India that have banned women's mobile use, even though a few of them have relented on that. I work in many communities across the African Sahel where uh, religious decrees, because the internet is you know, seen as immoral or Western, you know, there's decrees that have banned women and girls use of technology and internet entirely. So we really need to get to that core social norm. Um, actually, I'm going to, I'll skip through this. I'm going to talk too much as it is, but to, to show we have, we have projects that are doing that around the world, but I really want to get to the, the core of this with COVID, which is we've heard the statistics and we're probably going to be studying COVID for hundreds of years to come in all sorts of social science programs, but the rate of things like gender-based violence um, you know, has increased uh, during COVID. Um, there's been a lot of programs to try to bring e-learning, mobile health services, um, you know, registration for rations, for food rations, things like the M MNR Rega system in India online and make it more accessible to people. And yet when you have internet outages or if you have a family where women's tech use is banned or if you have to go two hours to charge a phone, 
you're never going to access these programs. Um, UNICEF, I'm putting some links up here and I will make these available, like I said, if you email me. Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies to show these increases of, of violence and the slide back we've made in women's empowerment. Um, there are some good suggestions on how to work with that and understand the proxy indicators of gender-based violence in these communities. But this huge shift to online means if you don't have effective connectivity, you're, you're more disadvantaged than before. And that's where I think all of us on this call have that call to action. Um, UNESCO um, and others did this amazing report called the, the Technology and Education for the Most Marginalized in, in post-COVID-19. Um, it's great, it's wonderful, it, it talks to people all around the world. It's a very comprehensive document on what idealized education hybrid systems would be as Frida was talking about. But you know, it's gonna require the will of large players and technology companies and governments that we don't have time to wait for, quite frankly. So in that case, you know, we can't just sit around and say, well, we have to wait for women to be empowered before they can come online and enjoy these things. Um, you know, empowered women are terrifying to communities. This is why people like to keep women in their box, under empowered and under informed, because in, in, you know, in, in so many places, you know, women are so second class and, and they certainly don't deserve or need the information you know, to help progress because that would really you know, challenge the status quo. But when I go into a community, I mean, the first thing to figure out is who can't access the technology and why not? It's usually not because there isn't technology. It's usually because of a social norm that says women shouldn't do this. So under what local conditions can we create conditions for women to come online? And that's working with religious leaders, with mother-in-laws, with employers, with family systems to understand where that danger they think that perceived danger is and how we can make this safe for women and also beneficial to the whole community. How do we bring technology to women instead of waiting for women to come to technology? We roll out all these training camps and then expect women to come. Well, women are busy um, and they can't leave their homes or maybe their property is at risk if they leave their homes. And what about childcare and what about the cost? I mean, there's so many crazy things and we've just been so uncreative in technology, in creating technology that will fit billions of women, literally, who need what we have. Um, so, I mean, over the last 20 some years, to me, it's really boiled down to these five elements. Anytime we go in, especially when we're doing post COVID or current COVID response is what are the social conditions that we need to be aware of? And where do we find, you know, those little in ramps in and test them and say, look, the world didn't fall apart now that your wife has the internet and now she can educate your daughters and sons. We need to be much more creative about the technology. No one's gonna have a smartphone anytime soon. And what kills me is when women's collectives and you know, self-help groups and savings groups get together and they scrape their money together to buy one phone for them all to use different SIM cards in, and they buy a first generation used smartphone that is so underpowered and has such bad memory and, and you know, is, is in such bad shape that it can't even access. So they've just wasted that money. In so many cases, technology is an additional tax on the poor as opposed to a development strategy. So what are we doing to create technology that's very specific to women's needs? Um, but these things will only work if we really address what gender and development organizations like Pratham and others, Women for Women International Care, others have worked on for so long, understanding how to address other social norm issues like girls schooling, um, uh, early childhood rides, FGM, et cetera. We must address the online safety issue for girls. Um, and we have to understand that we need to celebrate the men and leaders that let women go online and really hold them up as a paragon of the community. Um, so I think that's one of our key, key important factors. I do have some links to people who are just new to this topic, um, but I also think that yes, USAID can say this, uh, other researchers, D the former DFID, et cetera, we've all said the same things for two decades. Um, and, and we're not doing much to make this actionable. When Farida talked about radio, TV, yes, we need hybrid solutions. We need offline solutions. Why are we waiting for 5G? I work in countries where there's no internet exchange point and they're never gonna have, you know, even two or 3G running around. Um, or you look at regimes that close off the internet. Anytime there's any um, 
threat of social disorder. So we can't rely on connectivity, but we can rely on offline technologies, things like the Amplio Talking Book or Solar Spell or some of the um, Kai operating system, the Kai OS type of phones that have an offline piece, offline cloud solutions. Um, there's so many interesting things that we need to do from a hybrid perspective that aren't tied to this model of one woman, one smartphone, because that's just a broken mechanism. Um, I actually am doing some webinars. I'm delighted to be on this one, but I've been hosting them every Thursday in the month of May on these sort of five proven strategies that I'm going to make you dizzy and go back to. Um, and I'm um, sorry for the seasickness, um, but if you're interested in those, those are up on our Women Connect website. The third one is tomorrow. It's all about building women's confidence to even use technology because one of the saddest things, and I'm sure our other speakers can talk about this, is women lack that confidence and self-efficacy to even engage with technology. I hear from women all the time, I'm too dumb to use this, or my phone speaks French and I don't speak French, uh, you know, things like this. So a project like this, what we did in Bamako, in, it is my last example, I have to wrap up, um, you know, with an organization called Molly Health. This wasn't a technology company, this is a small health NGO. But what they realized was that they're trying to reach women in you know Molly's capital, they're trying to reach slum women to help them get information about COVID. What we needed to do was co-create with them a social network that worked with Bambara, which is a completely unwritten language, um, is not represented on the internet, and 80, 98% uh, of these women are illiterate. So making kind of the best from Facebook and WhatsApp and helping you know women telling us what features they want. Um, to make this a voice-based and picture and movie-based system, um, as opposed to a social network where they feel um, they feel unable to take advantage of these things. Oh, I don't know how to do that. I can't read. I can't do this, so I can't use this. And this works offline as well as online. So one example of some of the many projects that we do have around the world. Um, I will close on that map um, with the 16 projects that we have on the world uh, around the world. And pretty soon I'll be able to announce that 10 projects that have just came online in India in the last month uh, to start working directly with COVID response, but we're not quite ready to announce them yet. It's an honor being here. Thank you so much. I hope you took something from that around the context of connectivity, because I think governments and in donor agencies, we push connectivity, connectivity, connectivity. And the fact is that half the world is unconnected. So technologists and policymakers and social scientists, we just need to be far more creative and really meet women where they're at. Thank you so much, Dr. Sterling, for sharing with us your insights on the situation of women and their access to technology is surreal to realize that women are legally discriminated to access and use technology. Clearly, we have a long way to go. I would like to introduce the next two speakers. Uh, Judith Register is the Vice President of Programs at Girl Rising. Uh, Rising. Um, Judith is a global gender equity and equality champion with nearly 20 years of leadership experience, including 12 years in conflict and post-conflict communities and emerging economies. She has made a tremendous effort to advance equality for girls and women throughout Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, building programs in complex environments such as Democratic Republic of Congo with Women for Women International and leading girls' rights campaigns in the US with Plan International USA. Judith holds a BA in philosophy from Boston College and a master's degree in philosophy and social policy from American University in Washington, DC. Uh, the second speaker that she will join, um, Judy, will be Brenda Giacometti Comel. Uh, Brenda holds more than 10 years of working experience in the development field in Argentina. She has worked in the public administration, particularly in the National Ministry of Social Development, coordinating an auditing team doing field work for the certification of corporates and social organizations working in triple impact projects. She's also the Samsung former corporate citizenship uh, supervisor in the Southern Cone, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And earlier, she worked as the main lead for UNICEF's children rights and business team in Argentina. She holds a bachelor degree in political sciences. Welcome both the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Anna. And I'm going to sort of set the stage. It's a really great opportunity not only to be part of this great panelists of expert, but also for the audience here today who's working on these particular issues. So what Brenda and I have I structure this presentation in a way I give you some context, both around how we think about our work around girls' education, working with partners and teachers, but also how we respond to the work. Within the context of digital divide and COVID-19, there's been a lot of talk about how COVID-19 is the great equalizer, technology is the great equalizers, and none of those things are true. They are not true because the reality is the inequality that exists around gender, race, and class have only made access to technology more complex and the reality of COVID more complex. And so as we think about sort of like what we are talking about when we say digital divide in context where there is lack of access and availability of technology in some contexts, where there is access, there's affordability, there's a challenge. And where there is affordability and access, is there competence to actually build the confidence necessary to address the way women and girls engage through technology? Now, regardless of the context we are talking about, gender inequity remains a rigid structure. And you've heard both of my colleagues earlier talk about the way gender is around social norm. But the big part around how social norm is reinforced is the fact that technology and resources available, available for people to actually pay for those things are not in the hands of women. And so within the context of how we are sort of addressing this particular challenge, we've come to appreciate that in addition to building competence for confidence, we need to also think about and been thinking really hard about how do we address the issue of technology for education in context where we think about the phone, we think about the virtual world, we think about online. What about the other ways old technology and radio have been used? And so we've had to be very creative at Gorizing to think about technology, both old and new, looking at radio as a mean to engaging young people print. And so the current context as we all sort of come here today to actually think about where do we go from here and how do we continue to innovate around COVID-19, not only within the context of technology, but the, within the context of ensuring learning. Because learning, there are a lot of group of people still working offline, despite so many of us talking about the virtual world and the COVID-19 and the digital divide. So within that context, I'm going to hand it over to Brenda, who's going to share with you how across a number of countries we've laid out a hybrid structure working with teachers to help build the competence to feel more confident in engaging adolescent girls online and offline. Brenda? Thank you, Judith. Hello to everyone. So let me start by introducing myself a little bit in the contents of uh, Girl Rising. So I lead this program, which is called the Explore More program, which is being implemented in six countries. We are working in Argentina, Indonesia, Thailand, Pakistan, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And I see a lot of folks from the Philippines here. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, this program that we're implementing right now aims to build social emotional skills in young adolescents. So we talk a lot about what you guys were talking before, right? To build confidence, to be able to identify their own dreams, their own aspirations for life, they, their inner strengths, and how to better use them to actually achieve these dreams. And we do it by using the power of storytelling, because I don't know if you know this, but Girl Rising actually uh, originally started as a film back in 2013 that was showcasing the stories of nine girls from different parts of the world and the different obstacles they were trying to overcome in order to actually get an education, because they were uh, discriminate, discriminated against uh, because of being girls, right? So we use these stories, uh, we use it as a way to spark and start these conversations with youngsters around gender differences, gender stereo stereotypes, children rights and the right to an education, and to somehow make them relate to these characters in the stories and to think about their own aspirations and dreams for life. How do we do this? We don't work directly with students, we actually do it through teacher training. So we are specialized in educational curriculum development and in teacher training. 
And when COVID spread, one of the first things that we thought is, so how is it that we're going to support teachers now that schools are closed? I mean, in almost all of the countries that I was mentioning before, schools closed. Uh, there were like severe lockdowns implemented and we had to support somehow these teachers, most of them women, because their reality is that the majority of the teachers that we work with are women. And they had to turn all of the sessions and their classes to online platforms without even having access to technological devices themselves. So this was a tough uh, you know, moment because we had to have like this very close communication with them to understand what was the situation of all of, of, all of them, which vary a lot from country to country, if I have to be honest. And we needed to think of different ways of supporting them. On one side, we had to provide for some digital skills training for sure, because these women didn't know how to connect, for example, to a Google Meet or to a Zoom uh, platform to hold an online session and use a share screen option, use the benefits of chatting and engaging with the participants through the, uh, through the chat or maybe sharing a presentation and not even entering you know, the, the huge uh, kind of box around gadgets, tools, or platforms such as Mentimeter, Kahoot, or other things that can actually make you know, the presentation more engaging. We were talking about the basics of being able to have like an online session and have a conversation online with their students. And at the same time, we had to think of the fact that most of the teachers and also the students didn't have a computer in their houses so that they could actually you know, connect to this online session. In most of the cases, we were talking about people that were going to be using their smartphones to be able to communicate. And in some cases, for sure, even that was not an option. So one of the first things that we did, because our curriculum uh, is uh, originally planned to be implemented in person and through in-person workshops, is to develop an online curriculum, or at least a curriculum that can be developed or implemented through online platforms, which is not the same that saying that this is an e-learning platform, right? These are two like uh, big uh, different things because on one side, we're talking about a curriculum that is uh, in the format of a PDF file that is so light that teachers can actually, you know, send it and share it uh, through WhatsApp and they can download it in their phones and they can use it right from their phones. And then on the other side, we're also talking about using technologies or programs or apps available that you can actually access from your phones, such as the Google ecosystem. We uh, encourage teachers to use Google Meet, to use all the options that Google Meet actually offers them because Zoom is also another option, but it's a paid option. And this was also you know, a struggle for the teachers we were working with. And then of course, we had to think you know, of the students that were going to be participating of this. And we are probably talking about uh, students that as my colleagues formally said, they are working in their houses, their parents are working in their houses, they are studying in their houses, they have siblings that are also studying through online methods, so they probably don't have much access to many technological devices. So there's a problem of access to technology and there's the other problem about the quality of the internet connection. So what is it that we did? First of all, we gather information about the countries where we were working. As I was telling you, it varied a lot from country to country. I remember this uh, specific teacher from Argentina who was almost crying, talking to me and sharing that uh, she tried to you know, do her first online session and the students were actually bullying and teasing her because she couldn't uh, you know, unmute the microphone, something as basic as that. So one of the first things that we came up with uh, was a series of workshops to actually build competence, digital skills in these teachers and also build confidence. Because as uh, most of you were mentioning before, it was important for them to understand that they could actually do that. And the age group that we were working with was also special and it was very specific because when you talk about teachers and mainly when you talk about government schools teachers, because that's our main uh, target audience, you're talking about people that is, you know, above 40 years old. So most of these uh, things that we understand as something that we work, you know, on a daily basis and just you have to hop on, for example, an online session. It was very difficult for them. So after running these workshops to try to build, you know, digital skills and basic digital skills, uh, especially to use, you know, the, the Google ecosystem, which is what we mainly use through our curriculum, we also had to turn our curriculum into an online delivery curriculum. 
So as I was telling you before, we created this PDF format file that could actually be sent through WhatsApp. Most of the teachers and educators we work with, they're really uh, used to using WhatsApp. This is something that they use not only to communicate you know, between each other as colleagues, but also with their students. So we share this curriculum through WhatsApp and we start you know, holding online sessions with them and to uh, explain to them how to use it, uh, how to use the curriculum and how to use the apps and the programs that we were proposing, both through a computer and through a phone. So the results were very good. I mean, at first, I'm not going to lie to you. It was very difficult uh, to work with teachers in the countries where we are working through online sessions. At the very beginning, you know, and I, I believe uh, Ms. Farida was actually talking about this, like the first couple of months, is what, it was very hard for us to work with them. We were mainly targeting, you know, training them in these tools, but implementation was not really happening. They were not uh, confident enough to actually implement the whole curriculum through these channels. Then there were some learnings, you know, from the COVID experience, and I believe that even teachers learned to coexist a lot uh, better with this, you know, online system. So right now this year, we are seeing uh, mainly two countries leading the online delivery of the program, being this Argentina and Indonesia. And this is not actually odd because these are two countries that have uh, national policies around the delivery of computers to students. And at the same time, they have very good internet connection quality. So the other country that is also, you know, leading the segment, but a little bit behind is Thailand, because in Thailand, we're also being able to conduct all of the sessions online, but we are uh, mainly kind of implementing like a hybrid, uh, a hybrid system. Because although there is, you know, online delivery of the sessions and the activities, we are also uh, holding in-person activities because teachers still prefer uh, to do the activities in person. And then the situation varies a lot when we go to these other countries, like for example, Pakistan and Vietnam. In Pakistan, before COVID stroke, uh, the internet penetration rate was around 17%. So we were talking about targeting 17% of the total population, uh, which was, I mean, it didn't make much sense, right? So even today in Pakistan, the program looks almost the same as before COVID. We continue implementing the curriculum with in-person activities, and we do it mainly in community center organizations or community-based organizations, uh, because those are the ones that are not uh, that impacted or affected by lockdowns and you know, national policies and restrictions around uh, COVID. In Vietnam, the situation is pretty similar. Uh, in Vietnam, we are not really being able uh, to work online. This is because mainly you know uh, the online learning system is used in universities and colleges but not really in primary and secondary levels which are the ones that we are targeting and also because in vietnam we are targeting a very specific uh, you know group which is rural communities in different parts uh, of vietnam we were actually working in the northern region and also in the mekong delta and it's impossible to think that we can actually work with these communities online so over there, we are mainly working, uh, you know, with in-person activities. And lastly, uh, in the Philippines, the Philippines is a particular situation because although uh, since the beginning of COVID, the government suggested that the schools could actually implement an online learning system, this didn't work. Like the, the learnings from the first year of COVID showed us that actually the online learning system had so, um, had so uh, very poor results that actually even the government didn't want to suggest, you know, the schools uh, to use it. So right now, what we are doing in the Philippines is to work with this modular learning system, which consists of some printed handouts that we send to the students' houses so that they can actually fill in and then, you know, go back to the school so that the teacher can mark, you know, the activities. But it's not easy because we're talking about social emotional uh, skills that we're building in the students. So doing this through a modular learning system is very you know, challenging. So just to, to try to summarize what I'm, uh, what I'm sharing with you about the different experiences in the countries is when we think of technology and we think of the technological gap or the technological divide, we uh, tend to think of very like complicated stuff, but we are actually talking about everyday tasks and our everyday life. And for teachers, imagine like from one day to the other day, they were conducting in-person classes, you know, sharing printed handouts to the students. 
And suddenly they were facing this idea of not only having to turn everything to online sessions, but then to use this hybrid model. So they have to have their planning both you know, for the online sessions and for the in-person activities. Because right now in countries, for example, like Argentina and Indonesia, the teachers have to do both. So some of the, some of the students are in the classroom you know, taking a look at the, at the teacher and actually hearing, hearing her out. And then the other students are from their houses because they are separated in bubbles, taking a look at the same session through their phones or through their computers. It's very hard to plan for, for this kind of sessions, this hybrid uh, model sessions. So our working on rising targeted mainly being able to support teachers, uh, you know, in training with tools that can actually help them overcome these challenges. But I'm telling you the two main things that we actually managed to do was first to train them in this very basics and fundamentals of digital skills. I'm talking about Google ecosystem mainly and how to run online sessions. And then on the other side, to help them you know, build these sessions so that they could actually run the sessions over the phone. Because it's impossible to think that actually students are connecting uh, through a computer. So I want to be conscious of the time. I think I'll, I'll leave it over there and we can answer then the, the questions. Thank you, Anna. Perfect timing, Brenda. Thank you, Judith and Brenda, for sharing with us how you are working with teachers and developing curriculums. You're doing an amazing job training teachers and delivering these curriculums using technology that impact directly kids and their learning experience. Um, we're gonna start now um, with the Q&A section. Um, we have received several questions and actually the first one is for Professor Farida Lambi. Um, we have an attendee that says, while many children were not able to go to school for years in developing countries, this learning loss has increased due to COVID-19. How open distance learning, particularly open schooling, can play a role in their education? Uh, yes. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. uh, open learning and open distance learning is a very good concept. But uh, if you really ask me my personal opinion, it may not work well with early years. What we believe in India and uh, otherwise also that one should concentrate in on early years, whether it is the preschool and the standard one, standard standard three, which is more physical, uh, which is more uh, physical contact. And uh, basically, you need one needs to look at uh, how they will. It's not only about teaching, but it is more the socio emotional skills, which uh, just now the girl rising panelist uh, spoke about. And if you have to do that, then open distance education may not be the answer. But if you're really looking at higher grades, uh, say eight, nine, ten, then uh, open distance uh, learning works. But that also, it, it's in a very limited sense because uh, uh, in India, uh, going to school is not only learning, but going to school is like a safe haven, haven for children because they live in very, very vulnerable conditions. So, so when they go to school, they feel safe. Socialization is good. They get nutrition uh and uh, they have the teachers so in terms of the mental and the other emotional skills are also developed but i would not completely toy i mean get away with the get out of the idea of this uh, social uh, you know open school because we ourselves at pratham are doing open schooling uh, for girls who have dropped out some years back but now who want to complete education because grade 10 is like the qualifying grade for any jobs, any government jobs that they want. So we have now opened up centers where we facilitate this learning for these girls. And it is, and we have tied up or affiliated, I may say, to the open school board of the government of India and the state. So that, that and that's working very well. Same thing we've done with children with special needs, uh, especially in COVID times, children who are disabled are not able to go to school and anyway, schools are shut. There is a learning loss. Parents are very eager that some constructive activity should happen. Now, for, for them, we've got something called the open learning again, whereby we, we send the content as uh, 
uh, the earlier panelist was also saying, Brenda was saying, he send the content through a WhatsApp message, get a feedback from the parents and uh, make sure that the child is uh, learning. Does that answer your question? I think so. I think so, Farida. Now, I would like to know if uh, the rest of the panelists would like to wait in regarding this question, because I think it really applies to all of your presentations. Anybody else would like to wait in on this? Yeah, let me add a little couple of thoughts. One of the things we've been doing in Guatemala is radio. I mean, like, I think we all know radio is one of the oldest tools of education across the world historically. And so we found in the context of India, sort of the hybrid model have been one where we use radio in contexts in environments where, you know, affordability and access to virtual world or even WhatsApp was not, was not a possibility. And so what we've done, we've had these sort of like the curriculum printed, delivered to the child, and parents have been very involved in the process. And I think one of the things we know all too well, both in our work and I think what's been the global data is what it's meant for parents, particularly mothers engagement in their children's learning, the support for that learning in the COVID and capturing this sort of learning loss is really the need to support parents and household. Because we found both in our work with um, in Guatemala with the radio program, as well as our work in other contexts, is parents who are actually very much yeah. worried and concerned, despite all the added layers of responsibilities, have taken the leadership role in how do we support them to ensure both kind of like the hybrid home learning through radio and other means. In one other context, we had a home learning guide where we were using things like how to cook, using measurement to learn your math. You know, cooking had this whole element of science involved. So we've used these very kind of like home lived experience to this curriculum that was developed out of a partner with Kenya that we were able to distribute with our partners around the world across Asia uh, in Latin America, helping parents at home and kids who can read to support their parents through this measurement system to help to enforce math, science in reading and writing. And so there's these creative ways the time loss have been used to actually redesign learning. So when we think about learning loss as one element, what are the new ways that we can adopt learning and innovate around that as the time of staying home has impacted all of us in multiple different ways? All right, anybody else who would like to wait in? I just want to add to what uh, she was just saying that, uh, in fact, uh, the radio program has been one of the most popular programs in just now what Pratham has done with the government uh, in the state. And uh, we did a very simple thing, as you were saying, that the content was worked out with the help of the government. And every day, a lesson used to be released to this radio channel, which was dedicated. Uh, it was very funny that almost everybody has radio, so they were listening. But in some villages, some people did not have the radio. So the religious leader uh, the, who, who, mans, uh, who leads the temple in a village, what he did was he put a big microphone, uh, you know, a kind of a speaker on the top of the temple. And he got this radio lesson relayed through, the, uh, through, through, through this big mic speaker. And the entire village gathered to see what the lesson was being done. And I thought, and this is being done every day in the villages. And what I, what I, what we were so happy is that it is not only the radio program and not only that the children are learning, but that the village is taking the ownership and there is a learning environment in the community. Uh, so, you know, so it has a lot, it, for us, it had a lot of unintended effect also. We were looking at radio as something the lesson was being released. But it also showed us that how the villagers and how the senior leaders in the community are taking interest and ownership that, you know, my children should also uh, get access. Thank you, Farida. So the next question comes from Tavres. Um, COVID-19 has greatly affected marginalized communities and the most vulnerable are poor girls. 
And in this economic hardship, they are the least prioritized in the families. What will be the best strategies for bringing them in mainstream in these crisis times? Any of you that would like to take um, this question? I mean, I'll, I'll take it because I think something we think about hard and deep every single day because of the nature of our work and the context we are working in, both in Guatemala with the indigenous population. I started the conversation earlier saying that COVID is not an equalizer. You know, technology is not an equalizer. They have only helped to reinforce existing inequity. And so what is our job? I've spent my entire career looking at sort of gender equity and how it impacts prospects and opportunity for women and girls. And what we continuously are learning to the process is that while we continue to use radio and adapt to these kind of hybrid models, we have to also keep focus on the policy and resource allocations. And those resource allocations, you know, whether it's government policy designing to sort of say, where will we invest money to recover from COVID? And that priority of resources, because we can't exclude national policy because infrastructures impact access. And so a big part of our work as we continue to sort of work with adolescent girls is build campaign and support understanding around where resources are most necessary, both around when policy discussions are going on, but where do we invest in understanding what are the policies and resources and how they're being allocated. I think as practitioners to partner well with researchers and help to understand those areas, but also is to stay very closely linked to the government policy. And Brenda can sort of share with you some of the ways that we think about the national government policies and how those national government policy needs to actually filter to the populations that are most vulnerable to these kind of social restructuring that only forced to, re to make those who've been most vulnerable, more vulnerable. So that I think is something we all have to sort of be creative about, but be thinking about consistently. Brenda, yeah, I wonder if you, you know, will share some of the national policy government engagement we've done. Yes, uh, maybe to add what, what you were saying, and also conscious that there are lots of people from the Philippines here, I can tell you a little bit about uh, our experience in the Philippines. So we have started working with the government. We started having conversations with them back in 2020. And we have an agreement signed with the Department of Education in Palawan and also the Department of Education in Quezon City. So uh, uh, as, uh, as, you, uh, as you might know, uh, a remote area, so the internet connection quality is not very good over there. So from the very beginning, we were not thinking about an online delivery of our curriculum because it was not possible for them. We were thinking about running you know, in-person workshops with them when the lockdown was actually being lifted. As this never occurred, we end up working with this modular learning system I was talking to you uh, about before, which is giving us some results in terms of you know, reaching the students. But the quality uh, is a different conversation, right? Uh, and then in comparison, you have, for example, the Department of Education in, the, in Quezon City, which is actually working online. And we have trained teachers that are implementing this online session with, with students over there uh, with very good results, to be honest. Uh, but this is not really happening across the whole country in the same way. So there are lots of inequalities in terms of access, not only to the devices, but also the quality of, of the internet connection. And when you talk to the government, because another conversations that we've been having over there are with the Department of Education uh, in Metro Manila, they are the ones who actually suggest not to go for the online option because they are conscious about these inequalities that are present uh, in the students that they are trying to reach. And we're talking about government schools here. We're, we're not talking about community centers that work with a different uh, approach and, and work methodology. So in our experience working with the government in the Philippines, for example, what works best for us was the modular approach, but at the same time, keep having the, the option of the online learning for those who are actually in the condition to work with it. In other countries, like for example, in Indonesia, Indonesia is a country that before COVID, the internet penetration rate was around 48%, I believe. We're talking about like half the population. So we were not sure this, this was going to work over there. 
But right now, online learning system is a national policy in Indonesia, and the government has actually, you know, worked on these policies to deliver computers to students uh, that are in primary and secondary levels. So it became possible. And in Argentina, before COVID, the internet penetration rate, I believe I told it, was, was quite high. It was 74%. And there was a huge national policy here many, many years ago, uh, where all of the students that were, you know, in primary school received a netbook. And then that was supported by another, you know, delivery and some cash transfers uh, that were made several years uh, after that. So we could actually work in a different kind of environment because we were talking about that almost all kids, uh, you know, in school, because we're talking about enrolled uh, kids in school, right, had some kind of access to technology. And what's interesting about the Argentinian model is that the government uh, kind of compiled and merged this online uh, learning system and this e-learning platform with some TV shows as well. So I believe Farida was talking about this before. But TV has a way of, uh, you know, uh, uh, penetration. I mean, the way the TV penetrates the family and the way, uh, you, you know, you actually reach and interconnect uh, people is really higher than any other method. Because you are talking about something that can actually be watched by the same, by the same time by all of, you know, the children in one same house. And of course, there are activities according to the different age levels, but you do have like all of the options. So you have an e-learning platform where you conduct some activities. Then you have this, you know, TV shows that complement that. And then you have some modules coming to your house to complement this as well. So that's an interesting model. And that being said, what I would like to add just, you know, to finalize is that it's not that we're working entirely online or entirely in person in the countries where we are working. We are actually working in a, I, I wouldn't say even, you know, mixed, uh, it's a it's a hybrid system, but uh, it's a little bit of a, of lots of things because we're running in-person activities whenever we can. We are running online sessions. We are working with modules, and at the same time, we are exploring and working with TV shows and radio programs. So it's a little bit of all of what is out there. Yeah. I just want to add in India, the challenges are a little different. Like, you know, uh, because in India there is a national policy that we need to do online, but uh, you know, all the states have their own languages. And especially if you have to reach out to the, the most vulnerable, uh, we have to be very, very careful about the lingo or the language that we're using. It can't be English. It can't be Hindi national language. It has to be that state-specific language. And therefore, we tried to do TV, you know, shows and in terms of the content. But sometimes you do meet with these challenges because you, you write from translations, and you know the spirit of yeah. what the content is should not be diluted. So one had to really look at that. What has worked with us in India, and even what Pratham is being doing, is two things. One is that we have some very good books, Pratham books, and the it's called the Pratham books, and these are e-books, and uh, you know the, that's an open source. So anybody can take that book and you know make their own stories. And children, girls boys have started looking at those books and learning and it's also an enjoyment. So that's one source. So also we have a lot, we have a digital platform where we put all our videos, whether it is science, history, math, geography, and uh, it's in 11 languages. Okay, so mm -hmm. every language of the country, if we have the videos and uh, that the government likes. And uh, especially when you have it in the same language and the government has taken and adopted some of these uh, videos and uses for, for the government school. So I think that that has worked with us. So in, in India, uh, we have to be more localized. We have to be more decentralized, okay? And uh, especially in terms of the language and the uh, culture. And of course, this whole marginalized group, whether you say the street or children or, you know, the commercial sex workers, sex workers, uh, they are nowhere in, in the purview of all what we are actually uh, discussing. And they have to be uh, reached out, uh, you know, by contacting them. So, and with the kind of COVID the peak that we have just now, right now, uh, we really can't reach out to them the way we want to reach out to them, but we are trying our best. Totally Thank agree. You. And so... you know, the the... I'm sorry, just to add like a final note, the way we've been working with these marginalized communities you're talking about 
is through community-based uh, organizations. And we are sending printed uh, handouts with the Girl Rising storybook. So we have stories from these nine girls I was telling you about that are part of our film. So we have printed these books to send to these community centers so that they can actually engage uh, you know, the students and the kids mm -hmm. with the storybook and run the activities in person. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't look the same. I mean, as you were saying, when you were talking about technology, there's always a huge gap because marginalized communities don't have any kind of access. And we can talk about, you know, the, the quantity or amount of devices per household or the internet uh, quality connection. But anyway, you know, those most uh, vulnerable groups are not having any access to all of this. Yeah. All right. So we're getting fantastic questions. And let's see if we can tackle as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. So the next question actually comes for Revy. So uh, this attendee says, access to IT and digital divide are the problems for gender empowerment that you talk about. Meanwhile, with increased access to IT, it has created a lot of societal problems as well. Um, in, in this context, hello? In this context, so Revy, the question that this attendee has for you is, how could we maximize the utility of ICT for betterment of the society, especially for women in the developing world? I mean, it, it's a wonderful question. And it's literally what keeps me at my job for the last 23 years, sort of like what Judith was talking about with the, you know, the, this idea of valuing girls. And I mean, these are just so deeply embedded. Um, I mean, as I say, my, my biggest issue is that technology is such a tax on people. And I love it. I mean, technology is, you know, 90% of all jobs have a technology component. We need a digitally literate workforce. I understand that we need to be able to reach kids, but it's just what agencies and donors are looking at is so high level compared to the realities on the ground. And we need to listen so much better, you know, to the girl risings and the prothums who are just like, this is the reality stop with this 5G smartphone craziness and let's get be, let's be very practical. So when we talk about radio and we talk about TV, you know, if we can talk about things like, you know, if you see those little bars on your phone and you're connected to free Wi-Fi, free being in, and of course that has its security and privacy implications too, but, you know, maybe go to this link because now there's an ebook that we can talk about in this radio training that can link you to such and such. So the technology, the online technology piece, the ICT digital piece really supports, you know, the other community-based media education projects, supports teachers. There's too much crap, pardon my language, there's too much crap out there online. I mean, you can't just let people go loose and say, oh, go train yourselves. The internet is you know, this equalizer, which we know it isn't, it could be, but you add humans to the equation and it no longer is. Um, so I think that we have to just be so much smarter and more creative about where we pull in online resources, where we can take the materials that Prothom or Digital Green or other organizations have as e-libraries, how we can take those pieces offline, but have a little bit of online connectivity when it makes sense. Um, you know, so that people aren't paying an arm and a leg and aren't experiencing, you know, having everyone hates, you know, everyone wants to talk about the open internet. Well, the open internet is terrifying to most people, including myself, because it opens up so much risk. So having smaller, safer areas where, um, you know, where communities can interact with each other. We just, this is where the technologists need to, first of all, listen to the social scientists and the practitioners in the space and stop listening to donor lofty demands about this um, and then b we need to be more creative about what we're offering as opposed to saying oh just wait till the mobile network operators come to that area and everyone has a phone so it's a very broken mechanism that we have now um, technologists who want to work in the service of development um, need to work in the service of the community-based ngos and the faith-based ngos and the international ngos that know best like the orgs here Fantastic. So we have um, more wonderful uh, questions. The next one will be, how can we help change the social cultural narrative that drives the male-female education ratio in the global south? Any of you want to pick up on that? The social cultural narrative. 
that drives the male-female education ratio in the global south. Um, I bet you could talk about that too, Anna. Why, I mean, this is, I this know, is beyond, I know, I this know, is beyond I know. my expertise. I know, um, but uh, yeah. let's move into the next one. This, this well, attendee yeah. asked wonderful questions. If none of you want to pick up or address this one, we can move into the next question, which I, is- I can do it. I can do it. I mean, I think as an organization- I thought you did. You <laughs> will be fantastic because that's what you do, right? You work on the narrative, right? And yeah, so- Yeah, I mean, I think there's some there's some things to celebrate around girls' education, right? I think when we look at primary enrollment rate, we know sort of like the gap in comparison between boys and girls are on part, right? Like there are certain things we've made progress around. Where we when we reach adolescent, girls get dropped off for all the reason patriarchy and gender social norms we've been talking about sort of start showing up in terms of the way we see COVID have been what it is. The care economy as an economic structure has been gendered. And as a result of that, you've had women and girls sort of like pushed to the side. So I think part of that narrative is beginning to change. And what we do a lot at Gorising is not only tell great story about girls, is how do we tell these stories in a way girls of value. And I think we have a long way to go, but I think we've made significant progress. And I think we need to tell both sides of the story, the story of progress and the story of what's yet to be done, looking at both the infrastructure in terms of national policy priorities and commitment, whether it's the SDG or what Brenda has been talking about, or the specific work that you've heard from Dr. Faida in India. So I think we, we need to keep telling those stories but we need to keep telling them more, in more creative, in more beautiful ways. So that way we don't link this concept and narrative of vulnerability and you know, sadness with women and girls, but see them in their possibilities and brave and courageousness. I think we need to tell different type of stories. And for the development sector, that's a particularly important one. And I think at Grow Rising, we take this to heart. And if you look at our social media, you see a certain dignity in the kind of stories and images we show. So there's an image story that needs to be framed to actually contribute to the change of the narrative. Yes, I don't wanna take time to address these questions because that really for you, but you probably have seen the last um, meeting of G7 leaders and, and they concluded that educating girls was the top world priority. So that being said, we and have Anna, uh, I just wanted to add something mm -hmm. to what you and I just wanted to add to what Judith said that it is high time that we really celebrate girls education as I was telling you in my chat the other day that uh, you know we've been working with uh, girls and in fact Pratham had almost 60 percent women as their workers but we have these girls who are adolescent girls from the Muslim community or say from the street from the commercial sex workers or girls who are orphans and who are in the institutions. And when you really give them the opportunity, uh, they just fly. And we have several such millions, you know, thousands of such stories. And what has happened is that because a girl is educated and now she's empowered, you know, and I think I'm sure all of you know this, that she has a power over her own body. She decides when she wants to get married, you know, she knows, you know, what is some of the financial literacy bit. So, you know, you can see the entire family develop because of this girl's education. So I, I, I mean, there's no, there's no problem uh, with, uh, with this, but with COVID, uh, as I was telling you the other day, is that uh, there are lots of myths right now about being spread, you know, that girls uh, should not be vaccinated, their fertility will be affected. Uh, you know, if they are uh, menstruating, then they should not take vaccination. And there are certain religious leaders who are also, you know, kind of instigating for, you know, reason best known to them. So I think people like us should be sending these stories out and celebrating and saying and burst some of these myths so that, you know, because in, back in India, we are, vaccination has become a huge challenge. Not only because we have no access right now, there is a problem, but also people, some sex, some girls, some communities are resistant towards taking vaccination. So I, and that for me is a major concern right now. Yeah. 
All right, let's pick up a few more questions. Let's see if we can squeeze in the next three minutes. And then, uh, so the next question, which I think is outstanding is, how can we ensure social and emotional well-being via technology in this pandemic time? Any of you would like to pick up this question or address it? So uh, I will we've been doing, yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, right no, no, please, please. You're the, you're the practitioner doing the real stuff on the ground. So <laughs> you please go. Okay, so um, we've been doing this from the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, as I was telling you before, we started you know, uh, having chats with teachers to understand their situation and also to ask them to share with us what is it that their students were experiencing. So one of the first uh, things we did back then, you know, on top of, you know, teaching them to actually use this uh, new digital tools was to develop this home learning guides that Judith was mentioning before. So these guides were meant to address the whole family so that they could actually run some emotional health and mental health activities. Because to be honest, to all of, to all of us, I mean, the pandemic has impacted in so many ways. And we were all stressed because suddenly we were all, you know, in lockdown and working from home and coexisting in one same place with all the family. So it was very hard. So one of the first things that we did was to create some content that could actually target the situation that the families were leaving. Uh, from cooking, as Judith was, uh, you know, sharing to physical activities or to sharing stories. So our expertise is around storytelling. One of the main things or at the cruise of this uh, guys that I'm telling you about was to share stories with their children. We were encouraging parents to share their childhood stories. We were sharing with them some role models from the countries uh, where they were living in so that they could share with the children and have a conversation around this. And one of the things that we were uh, trying to actually uh, keep on doing was to build this confidence in the students. And one of the things that I have to be honest that I believe that the pandemic has uh, kind of impacted in the worst way is that most of the students today lack the motivation and you know the the engagement to actually participate of an online session to participate of school activities we are seeing this in all of the countries where we are working no matter the method no matter if we're talking about in-person activities or if we're talking about online activities they are not motivated enough after a year of school closure and you know activities being interrupted and then being in lockdown or you know locked up in their houses it's very difficult to motivate or to inspire them uh, to work on school activities or to have some kind of socialization with their peers so our curriculum focuses mainly on dreams and talking about dreams is what actually help us you know to overcome these challenges to go back to the curriculum and to say okay so we are in the middle of this crisis and anyway, we're trying, you know, for the kids to actually dream big for, the, for themselves and to think of a future that is different than the one that they are living right now. So we kept, you know, uh, running these activities and some of the workshops and seminars that we added were actually storytelling, you know, webinars or storytelling uh, activities. So they could connect online, they could hear the stories of different girls from different parts of the world and how they overcome different challenges. And we would then, you know, run a discussion around how is it that they were, you know, tackling or overcoming uh, the COVID situation. So peer to peer conversations, you know, peer to peer, them being engaged so that they could actually talk to each other. That's a very helpful tool. All right. So to be conscious of the time, um, unfortunately, we cannot address all the questions from the audience. I would like to first of all, thank all the attendees for joining us from over 13 countries today. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank the panelists. Uh, thank you for sharing your work, the insights on this topic. Thank you, Suman, for inviting me to more moderate this panel. It's an honor, a pleasure. Thank you to IDI as well. Um, Suman, I'll let you uh, finish this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So what a pleasure. You know, what, what a wonderful panel. And let's give a big hand to all of them. And I think it's, it's a pleasure for me to listen to all of you. Uh, I think it's, it was amazing. Oh, so, we can hear you. Come on, you went mute.
Yes. But Anna and Suman and IDI, thank you so much for pulling us together and doing this. This is so timely and I hope it was useful to people and um, uh, please stay in touch. It was amazing to see so many attendees. Yes. I have, I have asked my colleague to take all the questions and maybe I'll send it out in email to all of you. So if I get some of those answers, I will send them by email to our participants. All the questions are really, really wonderful. You know? So with that, having said that, I think we are right at the top of the hour. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. And uh, we'll see you next month in some other topic. Uh, look out for our announcement. And uh, there will be video available in our uh, uh, LinkedIn channel as well as in our Facebook page. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Doc. Bye, Suman. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.